Support for KAMU is provided by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts. This fall, the Academy will present Gelsey Bell's experimental opera Morning on October 24th and Ballet X, Philadelphia's Contemporary Ballet, on November 5th. More information at academyarts.tamu.edu. The Heart of Art is sponsored in part by the Texas A&M University Art Galleries, which includes the Stark and Forsyth Galleries located inside the MSC. The galleries provide a variety of opportunities to experience art exhibitions, events, and hands-on activities. More information at uart.tamu.edu. The Heart of Art, scoping the Brussels Valley for the best artists and bringing them to your radio. Howdy again, welcome back to the KMU Studios. My name is Hector Nino and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Today in the studios we have a very special guest. Her name is Wenyi Shu and she was an environmental scientist turned to artist and in her website, she describes her work focuses on capturing serene, sensitive, nostalgia, and sometimes surreal moments. So she has these beautiful, beautiful portraits. And if you'd like to check them out while we're having this discussion, you can go to wenyishu.com. And that's wenyi, W-E-N-Y-I, shu, Z-H-U.com. And her Instagram is also wenyishu2023, where you can check out those images. So hi, Wenyi. How are you today? Good. How are you? I am so excited for our conversation today. I came across your work uh, at the Visual Arts Society website, and I, I... saw that you recently won in the professional category so congratulations for that thank you um yeah how did that feel winning that competition oh it's exciting and uh, i i feel like i got recognized and i was so so gratitude for everything yes right and you started relatively recently right because i saw that your shows are mostly in 2024 all this year right uh-huh. yeah yeah and uh, yeah mostly yes Oh, so you just yes. started showing your work then? Yes, yes. But I've been creating for a while. Okay, okay. Yes. And we'll definitely be getting into that. All right. Um, okay, well, I like to go through the background of my artists before mm. we get into the art of it all. Um, so I know that you used to be a scientist. So uh, were your interests in science and art always kind of battling each other when you were younger? I I believe so. But uh, uh, from a start... Uh, uh, since I was very little, I started to fall in love with art. Mm. So I was born in China. Uh, Suzhou is my hometown, and it's a beautiful city uh, with uh, classical gardens and uh, rich cultural heritage. Oh, wow. And uh, my parents are not directly art involved, but my grandfather, he's a Chinese calligraphist. He can write beautiful Chinese characters. Wow. And okay. uh, when I was very young, I started to fall in love with art. And uh, there's one small but memorable episode in my life I hurt my leg I think was like three or four years old and I had to stay in bed for a while and my mother gave me crayon and paper and I started to draw and I was found this it's so entertaining and uh, even at a very young age I realized how much joy and comfort art can bring me so wow. I've been drawn to art ever since from such a young age yeah. three or four right yeah wow and that's beautiful that your mom even encouraged it as uh, well right yes okay yeah were they a part of like you going into science in- instead of into art or well why did you decide to go into science yeah eventually I actually chose a different path like mm-hmm. academically I got my uh, environmental science degree in college and then came to United States for graduate school and I got my PhD in uh, Rutgers University in New Jersey okay. and uh, but uh, besides the busy schedule of a graduate student I start I continued to create art even uh, like a free time so art is something like always there there for me right. yeah and I mean I think it's important to highlight as well that you're a self-taught artist yes, right yes so what was that process of teaching yourself how to how to create these pieces 
Yeah, I never had any formal art education, but I studied old masters' work and trying to understand their technique. Mm. So uh, I can name a few, like my favorite old masters, like uh, Raphael and Botticelli, Bouguereau, and even Lucien Freud, Edward Hopper, and Andrew Weiss, and uh, even Rene Marguerite. So wow. what they are in common is they are great Primarily, they are great figurative artists, and uh, they have this ability to express complexity of the human nature, the subtlety of human emotions. So that has a great influence on me. I'm trying to I express the same way as them, like in my piece. Right, so that expression of emotion through your art is something mm -hmm. that's important for you? Yes, exactly, mm, okay. yes. Um, and I know that you dip a lot into surrealism mm -hmm. as like an art style. Mm -hmm. um, were those also because of those inspirations that you had early on? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So the, the artist I mentioned, the Rene Magritte, he's a surrealist. And I think uh, to incorporate the surreal elements into my work can make my work more intriguing and interesting and as well as thought provoking. And this is actually what I want to do in my future direction, I want to incorporate more surreal elements into my work. Yeah, I mean, mm. I love surrealism. It's just like yes. like physical poetry like uh -huh. that you can see, yes. right? Yeah. Um, I did notice that you did have like a focus on faces mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, specifically like children's faces. Uh -huh. um, why why faces? What what is your attraction to faces? Um, yes. You can often see these young girls' face in my paintings, mm -hmm. and uh, that's my inspiration because I I think uh, the inspiration is basically the use and nature, and uh, I try to capture the purity in these figures because I mm -hmm. think the purity symbolizes the beauty of use, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So. That's why I love portraying faces, and especially the faces with different kinds of complex emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of the ones that, that I loved was um, A Furry Friend. Mm -hmm. I loved that one, and The End of Spring. Uh -huh. And I think they both have like similar themes, where it's yes. kind of like a, a rejection mm -hmm. of like growing up, even. Exactly, um, exactly. Do, do you struggle with those feelings as well? I think so, yes, yeah. yes, when I was young, because I, in a way, like I kind of have to choose a scientific career, but uh, I also have the love of art. So there's always a little struggle in me. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of portrait of when I was younger. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of felt like you were, in a way, like feeding your inner child or uh -huh. caring for your inner child. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, I'm thinking maybe like you, you focus on science mm -hmm. because you knew that it would get you, you maybe further in life. Uh -huh. um, but we kind of always like go back to our child, child selves uh -huh. and have to like nurture our interests when we were children as well, exactly. right? So yeah, it's always like that constant struggle between the two. Mm -hmm. I know that you use oil paint, mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to talk about how soft your images look. They're uh -huh. so, they look like they're blent. Uh -huh. um, how do you accomplish that look? So uh, the process like I'm using for my paintings called multi-layer oil painting technique. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a technique can date back to Renaissance artists and later French academic artists. So it's basically involved two steps. So first is called grisaille. Grisaille is just a black and white monochrome underpainting. So you just use black and the white and uh, the gray mixture and to cover the whole painting. And the final result is like a black and white photograph. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then when it's dried and you start to glaze, a glaze means use uh, these transparent or semi-transparent oil colors to cover it like one layer by another layer. And uh, you can repeat this like as many times as you want 
until the desired like final effects is there. So for example, like if I'm trying to portray the face, and the first step is the uh, black and white underpainting. And then I will try to add different of glazes. First, I add a cool tone, like the olive green, ultramarine blue. And then after this layer dried out, I add the warm colors, like uh, yellow ochre and uh, vermilion red. And layer by layer, and then it can achieve the effect of like translucent and the realistic effect I'm looking for in right. my painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds to be really time consuming because you it have is. to wait for it to dry, exactly. right? Exactly. Before every layer. Uh -huh. How long does a piece take you to make? Well, average. I think for like uh, 24 by 24 usually takes like a month, usually. Wow. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's incredible. I mean, yeah, you can definitely tell that there's a lot of work put into it. I just mm -hmm. didn't know how. <laughs> I had no idea how. So thank you for explaining that for me. Um, another series that I really loved was The Fragile Glitter. Mm -hmm. Because when I was going through your Instagram, I thought they were actual photos of dolls. Oh. <laughs> they looked so real. Um, what's the story behind that, the, the Fragile Glitter series? Um, I love dolls. Mm -hmm. like, as, as, a, as a girl, like uh, when I was little, I collect Barbie, wa uh, Barbie dolls. Mm. And I also love the uh, shiny surface of these porcelain dolls because I think it stands for a kind of purity that what I'm always attracted to and also the fragile the fragile feelings uh, that it's so beautiful but it can break so easily so I think that's the main story behind these paintings uh, I try to create this emotion of kind of like melancholy because you know it's going to break eventually but the, this moment is the best moment to see these beautiful images, to mm. see these beautiful dolls. I yes. see. Yeah, you have to appreciate the moment mm -hmm. that you're exactly. in. Exactly, yeah. yes. What do you, would you say is the purpose of art? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a, a big question. Yeah, it's very broad. I understand. Yes. <laughs> For me, uh, I want to create this beautiful and serene uh, scene that uh, on my mind mm. and uh, I want my viewers to feel the tranquility and serenity and sometimes even nostalgia mood that I feel as well mm. and uh, ultimately I want the viewers to to find the sense of calm and beauty that lingers with them even long after they've seen my work and mm. for me that's the purpose of my art and that's what I'm viewing on art okay yes. so you value the feeling that uh -huh. the viewer takes yes. from your painting. Exactly. Okay, yes. I see. That, that's beautiful. What exactly is your artistic process? Do you start with an idea or do you start with like an image, maybe like a photograph or yeah, how does that go from the beginning to end? Okay. Uh, yeah. So my artistic process usually start with an inspiration and this inspiration can come from anywhere, like a picture, a painting, some day to day life that I see and also maybe just a piece of writing. And then an image will form uh, on my mind. And I will try to sketch it out uh, on a paper. And the first sketch could be pretty rough, like just a few lines or blocks of colors, but it's enough to capture the basic idea. Mm -hmm. And then I will try to find the right model for my image in order to bring them to life. And sometimes I use my daughter as uh, my model, wow. but other times I would just search online and to find the right reference photo that uh, uh, fits my need. And then, then I will keep refining the sketch until I feel satisfied with the uh, pose, composition, and the expression, things like that. Wow. And from there, I will transfer my sketch to the iPad because I can play with the color palette. I can play with the color combination in order to convey the, the mood and the, the um, emotions I want to uh, express in this piece. And the, the good thing about iPad is you can try unlimited times right. as long <laughs> as you want and you play with it mm -hmm. and until I got this design I'm satisfied with and then I will stop paint to the canvas. 
Right, and no yeah. waste of paper on that one. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Saving the trees here. Yeah, that's environmental the science. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love that. You see, your science is still uh -huh. <laughs> involved in yes, your art. Yeah, yes. definitely. Um, I'm wondering about, you know, you have a daughter. Is uh -huh. art something that is important for you to, like, get closer to her? Uh, yeah, she loves art, too. Yeah. I think in a way, because she's always seeing I'm, like, painting out there, and uh, then she will grab paper and start doing the same thing. I think mm -hmm. that's one impact on her yeah. yeah oh this is beautiful and how old is she she's 10 years old 10 years yeah. okay yeah i'm interested in like your pursuing of science and what would you say to people who are kind of like picking their career and seeing like you know what am i going to do with my future should i go into something that's gonna you know get me further in life or should i go through like my passions uh -huh. first like what would you say to someone that's um, struggling with with that idea yeah so there there's a little story I want to share and sure. um, so after I got my PhD degree and then I started work as a postdoc in South Carolina for a while and mm. then I got married and moved to Texas and uh, it's during that time I start to feel an even stronger pull towards art and then I realized if I was going to pursue something I truly loved, and that time was now. So then uh, there was a very little thing, but it really stands out as like triggering for my decision to become a, a full-time artist. And it was like on a cloudy day, and uh, in the afternoon I was staying at home and I was looking at pictures, paintings that uh, created by other artists and on an online art community. And uh, I, I thought to myself, if I ever have another life, I will definitely become an artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, soon as, as, as soon as the thought came up and uh, immediately I realized how absurd I was because I have a whole life ahead of me and here I am thinking about the next life. Right. And I think that's a moment I decided to make art my main focus in life. So it's wow. a very little thing, but looking back, I think it's a triggering point yeah. like I my, to make my decision. Yeah, one little thought in your brain uh -huh. just changed the course of your life yes, completely. Yes. Yeah, I love that. that that's beautiful. All right, Wenyi, thank you so much for stopping by and thank talking you. to us about your art. I, I, I love your art, and I'm so glad to finally get the story behind it. Thank you so much. All right, you guys, we will be going on a quick break, but do not go anywhere. We will be right back. The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. Alrighty, now we will be listening to a snip of my interview with Dr. Amanda Stronza that we had back in March 3rd of 2024. Today in the studios, we have a very special guest. Her name is Dr. Amanda Stronza. She is a professor here at Texas A&M in the Department of Ecology and Conservation. She is an anthropologist and conservationist, as well as a photographer. And she has um, gone a little viral in, on her Instagram, where she posts memorials to road-killed animals. Uh, and she's also a photographer for Getty Images. So, hi, Dr. Amanda. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you for saying road-killed animals instead of roadkill. I yes. really appreciate that. I'm so honored to be here, by the way. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Well, in the show, we like to go through the background of our guests and get their origin story. And I'm very interested in your origin story to see where these memorials uh, came about. Uh, so where are you from? And is this where your love for animals started? Yeah, well, thank you for asking. And uh, let's see my origin story. I, it's hard for me to talk about anything in my life without thinking about how I have felt always especially connected with 
the animals who either lived in my home with me as, you know, as we call them pets, mm -hmm. or the animals who I've just been so in love with outside of my home, just wandering around the forest where I grew up. I grew up in, um, Mar I was born in Maryland. I grew up in West Virginia. And I went to a pretty, um, I lived in a really economically poor part of the country in my high school um, didn't have the best resources. I had some great teachers, but my real love has always been animals and wildlife, and I thought I would be a biologist. But my, um, my teacher in high school, great as he was, his real strength uh, was teaching uh, taxidermy. So oh. my high school, we closed for hunting season because that was a big deal to go, and I, I wasn't a hunter. And taxidermy, I understand, is a great art, but it wasn't something that really appealed to me. So I, but I did have a wonderful social science teacher who uh, lit a spark in me about um, anthropology and uh, political science and all the, the social sciences. But I thought, oh, well, if I love wildlife, I guess I'll, I'm just relegated <laughs> to be a social scientist. I guess I'm never going to be able to work in that field. But uh, what I've really developed with my career is a focus on wildlife by understanding how humans relate to wildlife. <laughs> and in so many cases in conservation, that's the real puzzle, the real conundrum, is how and why do people care about certain species as they do? Under what conditions are we more likely to go out of our way to protect populations of animals? Why do we care about why do we have disdain for other animals, and what drives all that? Is it is it economic incentives? Is it education? Is it religion? Is it the family we grew up in? Is it the pet we had? What what shapes that? And so that's the really that's what I do in my career as an environmental anthropologist. I study and uh, and seek to support. Well, I study human wildlife interactions, and I seek to support people who live close to wild animals. Um, what kinds of uh, support do they need? The animal memorials are a bit tangential, mm -hmm. but also very much related to my work. Oh, yeah. Because um, it certainly is, relates to how humans relate to other animals. Mm -hmm. um, but that came, how it came, you mentioned that I have this, a, a big, uh, gosh, I'm hesitant to say a big following because it just makes me sound really conceited. I have a following. <laughs> it's true. 50,000 followers yeah. is, is a good amount. <laughs> oh, I just like, everybody hates an influencer, right? So, <laughs> yeah. oh, I don't love to emphasize that as, as grateful as I am to have that platform because hmm. um, it gives me a chance to, to write about things that are meaningful to me and to, to, to get us thinking, hopefully, about how we live with the neighbors among us, the non-human beings who live in our communities who we are so often insensitive to or even blind to. So again, to the animal memorials. For years, I have had the practice of stopping when I see like a dead squirrel on the road or any animal hmm. who's in rel enough, relatively good condition that I can take him off the road. Right. And I was really inspired by the author Barry Lopez, an author and naturalist Barry Lopez, who wrote about that in his book, um, Apolo Apologia. And he wrote about driving across North America. It's a small book among Barry Lopez's incredible books. But he writes in the most poetic um, and profound ways of how he felt when he saw a raccoon killed on the road. And he had a practice as well of stopping and taking him off the road because it seems so disrespectful to just leave them there and let the traffic keep driving by. It's like uh, a kind of disregard, like treating an animal like they're nothing, like roadkill, as it were, like an object or like trash. Right. And so he really inspired me. And so I'd, I'd just always done that, and it was natural for me to do. And I typically mm. would just cover them with branches. or. And then there was a time um, about four years ago, maybe five years ago now, I was walking on a trail in downtown Austin, and I came upon a squirrel who had been killed on the trail. It wasn't even on the road. It was a hike and bike trail. And people were just streaming past the squirrel. They were, you know, pushing strollers, jogging, walking their dogs, chatting with their friends, just totally disregarding the squirrel that was right there in front of them. They had to step over him, but also at the same time not paying attention. I pulled the squirrel to the side of the trail, and it was spring. There were flowers everywhere, so I put flowers and pine cones around the squirrel, and I thought, gosh, he looks so beautiful. I, I want to take a photo. So I just snapped with my phone a photo, and I 
put it up on Instagram and said, um, I'm sorry to the squirrel. And I said, no one will see you as just another dead squirrel. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that photo got a lot of attention, but I didn't have that many followers. I typically shared photos uh, from my work in the Amazon or in Africa, lots of elephant photos photos of my dog I'm live animals <laughs> so this was the first dead animal I'd shared mm. but somehow it hit a nerve um, and I noticed that people cared and people felt like so often people say to me when they see the memorials for dead animals that it gives them a kind of peace mm. and um, a kind of sadness but at the same time hope yeah. A sense that, oh, there are people who care. Or so many people mm-hmm. say, oh, it's okay to do this because I've always done this too. Or this is mm-hmm. validating because this is something I want to do. Or this is something I wouldn't do, but this feels like something I would like to do. And I like seeing other people do I think right. there's like a desire to atone in a way mm. for us collectively to say I'm sorry Right. to so many of the violences we bring upon other animals mm-hmm. who live among us. And so I think maybe that's what's what why the the animal memorials appeal to people. Mm-hmm. So I will say since that squirrel I've created more than 100 memorials for so many different animals for many many squirrels that's probably the most common animal. I don't mm-hmm. want to say common. I never like to call any animal <laughs> common. The most frequently memorialized animals is squirrel. Right. But armadillos, snakes, coyotes, a bob um, bobcat kitten um yeah, everything m- and I, so many. Yeah. <laughs> so many. And we'll Inclu- definitely get yeah. more into okay. that. But I, I wanted to ask uh specifically photography was that something that you were interested in as a as a young person as well? Yeah. Um, I, I got pretty passionate about photography when I was 15. My grandfather gave me his uh, Minolta, which I then carried with me to South America when I first started learning how to be an anthropologist. I carried my camera to the field and doing ethnography where I'm living in, living with people in the communities that I'm learning about. So much of my understanding came through photography as well. So I would take field notes and also a lot of photos. And in those days, I learned how to do, how to be a photographer using film old wow. school. I mean, I mean, I know lots of people do that still, <laughs> but that's how I learned. And I always say, I think that shaped the photographer I am mm. because I would go off to South America for several months at a time and I could only afford to carry like 10 rolls of film for the whole summer. And so every photo, there's a real calculus about like, you know, framing, composition, timing. So every photo really counts. And then I'd have to wait three months to come home to process the images to right. see what I got. So now as a photographer, as a digital, using, of course, digital technology, I'm still a very careful I know because I'm, I'm always surrounded by fellow photographers mm-hmm. and with Getty images and so forth. I'm aware of people who, or like on safaris, the people just like shoot their cameras like they're fire, like machine guns or something. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't do that. So I'm like a single click at a time. You're very strategic. I'm very strategic about it. There's still an economy, a certain calculus involved. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, I've always been really passionate about photography. Well, since I was 15. So in some ways, the memorials are a marriage for me between my passion for photography and my passion for animals. Mm -hmm. The other thing I love about creating the memorials is it gives me an opportunity to write creatively about animals and, and, and the human relationship with animals and how I personally feel about even one squirrel. I like to write about the individual animal. Yeah. And that's not something that is as accepted, certainly, in my field in conservation science, where we mm-hmm. tend to write more about populations of animals and we're meant to write dispassionately and objectively and um, certainly not in the creative way that I get to do with the memorials. Yeah, so. I love how you personalize each memorial, it, not only with the plants that you use to decorate it, but even with the com- caption itself, Thank it's a you. whole story, of course. Um, I, I was curious, like, was death something you thought about often? and Or did that come about after mm. your studies? Mm, yeah, I think you're the first person to ask me this. Uh, I would say that I have not spent my life being preoccupied by death. 
Um, and I'm joking a little bit, but I'm also not in that since I've started writing more um, explicitly about death and themes around death, it's something that's become more and more important to me and almost sacred and I feel has, I don't know, it's been a real change in my life in a positive in a positive way if you'd like to listen to the full interview you can go to kamu.tamu.edu and search the heart of art i'm hector nino and you've been listening to the heart of art a production of 90.9 kamu fm you can find all of our shows anytime at kamu.tamu.edu The Heart of Art is sponsored in part by the Texas A&M University Art Galleries, which includes the Stark and Forsyth Galleries located inside the MSC. The galleries provide a variety of opportunities to experience art exhibitions, events, and hands-on activities. More information at uart.tamu.edu. Support for KAMU is provided by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts. This fall, the Academy will present Gelsie Bell's experimental opera Morning on October 24th and Ballet X, Philadelphia's contemporary ballet, on November 5th. More information at academyarts.tamu.edu.